It's safe to say that JavaScript has matured over the years. How we write JavaScript applications today is drastically different than how we did just a decade ago. Nowhere is this more prominent than when it comes to fetching data from external APIs. To truly understand how we got to where we are today, let's take a trip back to the past. Seatbelts, everyone! Please let this be a normal field trip. In the beginning of the web, there were just documents with links between them. We're writing on the internet, cyberspace set free, hello virtual reality. When a browser made a request to the server for a particular page, the server would find the HTML file stored on its hard disk and send it back to the browser. Not long after that, servers started pre-processing the HTML before it was sent to the client. Every time a browser would request a page, based on the user's cookies or authentication headers, the server would generate the HTML on the fly for that specific user. This allowed companies to start creating websites that allowed you to do more than just read documents. Deliveries for pets.com. But there was still something missing. Yes, pages were being dynamically created on the server, but the end result the user got was still a static experience. Not only that, but this process meant that every change in a page's content required a full page refresh. Then, in 1999, everything changed with one invention. What's that? Me up, it's my Furby. Oh, no, not that. When I think back hard, it was because we couldn't build great applications on the web technologies of the time. We could build information resources, you know, you could read things and do things and so forth, but you couldn't build web applications that were at the scale and power of the then existing desktop applications. <laughs> there was a technology built in 2003, 2004, which came, it was called asynchronous JavaScript and XML, abbreviated as AJAX, which built the first interesting web apps. Gmail, for example, was either the first or one of the early first Ajax applications. And all of a sudden people said, you know, this web thing is actually kind of useful. I can write some pretty interesting applications, they can update themselves and so forth and so on. Ajax changed the game because it allowed browsers to send and receive data from the server without needing to reload the page. This one change ushered in the next era of rich, dynamically generated web apps. So what did this exactly look like? So basic implementation using low-level Ajax, uh, you got a lot of code in there. Right? So you create a new object, and you open, and then you assign your own ready state chain, check the ready state, and you check the status code, and then you try to parse the response. You go and you pull in the status node, and you want to make sure that it's also OK. And then you process the data that's in the data node into some format that everything can understand, because you don't want it in XML. And then you pass that into handle success. And if any of that doesn't work, then you want to call handle failure. Though it was a little weird, the XML HTTP request API worked because JavaScript treats functions just like any other value and that you can assign them to variables. Another benefit of being treated like any other value is that you can pass functions as arguments to other functions, which is used in just about every JavaScript library you'll use nowadays. When you do this, the function you're passing as an argument is called a callback function. In general, there are two popular use cases for callbacks. The first, and what you see in the map example, is a nice abstraction over transforming one value into another. The second, and what we see in the jQuery and React examples, is delaying execution of a function until a particular time. It's the second use case that is the more interesting one. Instead of delaying execution of a function until a user clicks a button, what if we delay execution of a function until we receive data from an external API? In fact, for years, this was the pattern we used for fetching external data. We just saw this with the raw XML HTTP request API, and we see it again with jQuery's abstraction over it called getJSON. It's as if we said, hey jQuery, here are two functions. If at some point in the future the request succeeds, invoke handle success, passing it the newly fetched data. If it doesn't, invoke handle failure, passing it the error that occurred. This was a perfect use case for callbacks, and it was great until it wasn't. Take this code for example. Here we have a callback nested inside of a callback, and if we were using jQuery, nested inside of another callback. This became so prevalent that it even had two nicknames, callback hell and the pyramid of doom. The problem is, with each layer of nesting, it becomes more difficult to understand what's going on because it forces you out of your natural way of thinking. One common approach to minimizing the effects of callback hell was to modularize your code. But is this objectively better? Probably not. We've kind of just spread the mess around and called it more readable. The fundamental problem still exists. And this isn't the only problem. Another problem here has to do with inversion of control. When you write a callback, you're essentially inverting the control of your program over to another program. It's entirely possible that this third-party library could break how they interact with your callback. So how do we fix these problems? Well, we can look at a real-life example for some hints. Welcome to day. 
the service was really beautiful. Have you ever been to a busy restaurant without a reservation? When this happens, the restaurant needs a way to get back in contact with you when a table opens up. Historically, they take your name and yell it when the table was ready. This worked, unless the restaurant was too crowded. Then they decided to start getting your phone number and text you once a table opened up. This allowed you to be out of yelling range, but more importantly, it allowed them to target your phone with ads whenever they wanted. Sound familiar? Well, it should. Or maybe it shouldn't. It's an analogy for callbacks. Giving your number to a restaurant is just like giving a callback function to a third-party API. Once you give it up, you've lost all control of how it's used. Thankfully, there is another solution that exists. Instead of taking your name or number, they give you this device. When the device starts buzzing, your table is ready. You can still do whatever you'd like as you're waiting for your table, but with this, you don't have to give up anything. In fact, they have to give you something. There's no inversion of control. The buzzer will always be in one of three states. Pending, which is the default initial state when you receive it, fulfilled, which is the state when it's flashing and your table is ready, or rejected when something goes wrong, like maybe the restaurant is about to close. The important thing to remember is that you, the receiver of the buzzer, have all the control. Regardless of which state it's in, you get to choose how to respond. So what does this have to do with async JavaScript? Well, if giving the restaurant your number is like giving them a callback function, receiving this little buzzy thing is like receiving what's called a promise. Exactly like the buzzer, a promise can be in one of three states. Unlike the buzzer, instead of these states representing the status of a table at a restaurant, they represent the status of an asynchronous request. If it was successful, the promise will change to a status of fulfilled, and if it failed, the promise will change to a status of rejected. The way you create a promise is by creating a new instance of promise. Next, you need to be able to change the status of a promise. When you create a promise, the promise constructor function takes in a single argument, a function. This function is going to be passed two arguments, resolve and reject. Resolve allows you to change the status of a promise to fulfilled, and reject allows you to change the status of a promise to rejected. Now the question is, how do you listen for when the status of a promise changes? Well, a promise is really just a JavaScript object that has two methods on it then and catch. Here's the key. When the status of a promise changes to fulfilled, the function that was passed to then will get invoked. When the status of a promise changes to rejected, the function that was passed to catch will get invoked. So now that you know your way around the promise API, let's do some refactoring from our code from earlier. Notice that we no longer need to pass on success and on failure arguments since we're no longer inverting control. Instead, we can use the promises resolve and reject functions. Now that get user and get weather return promises, we can update where we invoke those functions. Our new code is better, but there are still some improvements we can make, specifically around what's called chaining. What's cool about promises is that both of then and catch will return a new promise. That seems like a small detail, but it's important because it means that promises can be chained. This solves one of the downfalls of callbacks, specifically that callbacks force you out of your natural way of thinking. However, it's not without its trade-offs either. The biggest problem with chaining has to do with getting state down the chain. In order to invoke handle success, we need both the weather and the user. Unfortunately, with how we've currently implemented it, user gets lost inside of our getWeather function. So we can either create a temporary variable in the parent scope to hold the user, or we can pass along the user from inside of our getWeather function when we resolve. Either way, this is a step in the right direction from our original callback problem. In fact, at this point, we can even get rid of jQuery's getJSON altogether by refactoring to use the native fetch API instead, which also returns a promise. So this is great, but can we do even better? The best API is often no API. And as we saw, chaining promises isn't without its trade-offs either. Let's assume that we were on the TC39 committee and had all the power to add new features to the JavaScript language. I am master of the universe. What steps could we take to improve this code? Well, one issue that we did run into was that we needed to thread the data from the first async request all the way to the end. But what if we just wrote our asynchronous code the same way in which we write our synchronous code? If we did, this entire problem would just go away. Sadly, this obviously won't work since user and weather would both just be promises. As is, this code would be really tricky to make work. We'd have to somehow teach the JavaScript engine to know the difference between asynchronous function invocations and regular synchronous function invocations on the fly. Let's add a few keywords to our code to make it easier on the engine. First, let's add a keyword to the main function itself. This can clue the engine into the fact that inside of this function, we're going to have some asynchronous function invocations. Cool. Now let's add another keyword to let the engine know exactly when a function being invoked is an asynchronous function and it's going to return a promise. Pretty nice. We've invented a reasonable way to have our asynchronous code look and behave as if it were synchronous. And as you've probably guessed by now, this feature is already part of JavaScript and it's called async await. There's just one more thing we didn't talk about and that's error handling. In our original code, we had a way to catch any errors using catch. When we switch to async await, we remove that code. With async await, the most common approach is to wrap your code in a try catch block to be able to catch the error that occurs. So whether you're using callbacks, 
promises, or async await, getting comfortable with data fetching is critical for any JavaScript developer, and understanding how we got here gives you the historical context to do just that. Interactive appetite, searching for a website, a window to the world, got to get online. Take a spin, now you're in with the techno set, you're going surfing on the internet.